the theme of the Rite of Spring is a day and a night in the lives of the ancient Slavs. It starts off with an old woman, a, a crone, a witch of 300 years old who knows the secrets of the earth. She teaches the young men to jump. She teaches the young people in the tribe how to jump and warm the earth. That's the beginning of the ritual. At the high point of the ritual, an old man is brought in, a sage, the oldest and the wisest. He kisses the earth in the center of the tribal square. He links the earth with the energies of the sun god, Yorillo. And immediately his energies come down. And they have to be danced out by the tribe. The tribe have to work hard to control these energies. And then they, they dance them into the earth. And these are the energies that makes, make the crops grow, makes the animals reproduce, etc. So that's life for that year. Sun God has to be repaid each year for this. In Act 2, it takes place at night. You have the young women in the mountains divining the future. One of them has to be chosen as the bride of the Sun God. And they're, they're walking in a circle. One of them stumbles. Then she stumbles again and that is the signification that she has been chosen by Eurillo to be his bride. The ancestors come in and they carry out a ritual of inspection. Eventually she has to dance this sacrificial dance whereby she dies and she dies to save the tribe, she dies to save the earth and at the end she's lifted up by the, um, the eldest, the ones in the bearskins and presented to the sun god Urillo and she joins with him in a, in a kind of a mystical union and those were the beliefs of the ancient Slavs according to Nicholas Rorschach. It was necessary, first of all, before looking for the costumes, to find the designs and to clarify which ones were the Rite of Spring and which ones for the Rite of Spring in 1913. That, that, that wasn't easy. Millicent and I have staged this <coughs> ballet now so many times and restaged it that it's quite easy to just accept that it, all the knowledge is there <coughs> as regards Rurik's designs and the costumes and the decors. But it wasn't the case when we started mm. because Rurik had lived in Russia. He'd left Russia at the time of the revolution or just before the revolution. He came across Europe to England, to the United States, and then he'd gone to Asia. He'd done many paintings, easel paintings, on Slavic themes. And he'd also designed on a number of Slavic theatrical works and on more than one occasion. And he'd done variants for the designs. There was great confusion amongst um, art historians, writers, and, and various people who were interested in theater about Rurik's designs. In Russia, when we, uh, Millicent and I went and interviewed the curator of the Russian Museum, who was an expert on Rurik, 
she was convinced that the um, maidens in both acts only wore white costumes. There were many difficulties. The this, of course, was partly because the costumes had survived in the Western museums. Yes. And this was still the Soviet period. Yes. This was and in the 80s before perestroika. Yeah. So, so the, the, she, she hadn't seen them, and she yeah. was so sure that we were wrong. It, it was necessary, first of all, before looking for the costumes, to find the designs and to clarify which ones were for the Rite of Spring and which ones for the Rite of Spring in 1913. That, that, that wasn't easy. And then it was a question of finding the, the costumes and the accessories. They were spread in various museums. And also, you know, in, in this whole process of working on the, the color and, and the aesthetic of, of Rurik as part of, of the Sakura, we did have the help of, of Rurik's son, Svetislav, who was also a painter, a portraitist living in India. Rurik's costumes were, were made by Kaffi in St. Petersburg, as it was then. And they were painted by, in Rurik's atelier by Rurik's students who helped him. And Svetislav Rurik could tell from the brush strokes on the various costumes, we, sh we showed him photographs, which of his father's assistants had painted which costume. He looked at, he, he just mm -hmm. took one of the, the samples that we'd brought to him and, and he, he looks at this and he says, Shikitikana, mm -hmm. who, who was the wife of Belieben, the, the, the painter of Belieben. Shikitikana, he says, yes, that's, that's, that's the way she made mm -hmm. the stencils. One of the most amazing moments in the whole process of the research and the reconstruction and restaging up until now to this moment was that first uh, dress rehearsal with the Joffrey in 1987 when we did the, uh, the first production, when we saw all the costumes on stage in color, because it had all been in units and, and, and building blocks up until that moment, and suddenly we saw the whole stage in stage light. It was this, we were seeing them for the first time when we listened to them and saw them played against the music. It, it was such mm. an extraordinary thing, and we realized that in spite of all this meticulous color work that we'd done over the years, in our heads somehow, we had the black and white photographs. And suddenly, the Ballet Russe had the benefit of color. The genesis of the Sarko du Pantone concerned four people. The three collaborators, Nicholas Roerich, Igor Stravinsky, and Václav Nijinsky, and in addition, the impresario Serge Diaghilev. Uh, Stravinsky needed to work on another ballet, and in conversation with uh, Diaghilev, Diaghilev suggested that he should go to see Nicholas Roerich, whom he said had a number of scenarios already prepared. And so Stravinsky went to see Roerich. Roerich gave him the choice of two. One concerned a Slavic ritual, and the other concerned a game of chess. Stravinsky chose the Slavic ri ritual, and so Rurik showed it to him. So Rurik was the, was the father of the ballet. So they worked on these together, they agreed the names. Rurik wrote out a scenario, and Stravinsky went off. But before he went, Stravinsky composed some of the music whilst he was there. And Rurik did some of the costume sketches and a decor sketch. Rurik was interested in philosophy and he was interested in the, the ritual movements of the, of the shamans and the, the ancient Slavs. And he embodied these movements in, in, uh, in these ritual geometric patterns into his decors and into his costumes. First of all, let me say that he used the circle and the square. The costumes were by Rerich, although they were very like Russian peasant costumes I had seen in my life. The strongest memory of my childhood is of the country fairs I was taken to in the Ukraine. The songs which I heard 
and the dances which I saw have stayed in my imagination all my life. Yagilev encouraged me to use a huge orchestra. I am not sure my orchestra would have been as large otherwise, but this did allow me to build chords and harmonies much richer and more complex than ever before. So new, in fact, that the sacrificial dance at the end, in which a chosen virgin dances herself to death, I did not at first know how to write. I was guided by no system whatever. Very little immediate tradition lies behind the Sacrity Pranatama and no theory. I had only my ear to help me. I heard and I wrote what I heard. I am the vessel through which the sucker passed.